illustrious speaker. And so while we're waiting, I'm going to give you a brief overview on why the library hosts this series and what we're hoping for today. So this is a weekly series that's hosted by the library because we see it as an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. And whether or not you agree with everything you hear in your sessions or find on our shelves or in any of our books, we believe that you should have the opportunity for, to learn from a wide range of viewpoints. So, while we're discussing today, I'm hoping that we can all remain respectful of each other and each other's opinions and perspectives and keep this a friendly and collegial environment. So, I've put some resources on the board in case you want to learn more about this topic. If you want to find other resources, feel free to talk to either myself or Kelly McHenry, who's on the computer right now, and we can help you find magazines, newspapers, etc. So at the end of the discussion, I'm going to ask you to fill a brief survey and ask you to let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, how we can improve. And I'm just going to put in my spiel that we love having faculty and staff members, and especially students, host these, host these conversations. So if you are passionate about a topic, feel free to contact either myself or Kelly, and we can get you on the schedule. So next week, Robin Nussbaum and Regent Brown from the Nonprofit Anti-Racist Coalition will be facilitating a discussion on the role of education in structural racism. But today, in a moment, we will welcome Dr. Joette Dawe Zuari, who's a political science faculty member here, as we discuss the regional and global impact of the Syrian refugee crisis. All right. I've been teaching uh, international uh, relations and um, other relevant uh, courses in history as well. And some of uh, you are known in my classes uh, this quarter, in my classes. I can I see some of my evening class. And uh, from my American government class, in the international relations. So uh, this is a very important topic because it's Current. It's also uh, a transnational, transcends border, it affects uh, not only uh, Syria, but also it affects uh, countries, especially countries next to Syria. Uh, but now it has crossed you know, bodies and waters and it's affecting uh, Europe. Uh, it also uh, affects us here in the United States. Uh, this is a result, of course, of uh, the world has become, you know, has become a very interdependent and interconnected. Um, we've had incredible uh, transformation in terms of uh, transportation, uh, technology, even though the Syrian refugees are not really using it, they're using um, uh, uh, very treacherous modes of transportation, and many of them have died crossing the seas uh, and walking. Okay. So I'm going to try to to put this in a context, historical context. Uh, <coughs> usually we, we tend to forget very quickly uh, uh, what led to this situation. So we focus on the moment, uh, and we are told by the human tragedy uh, and the refugees and you know, some of the uh, pictures, because now we live in a world, in a world where we get to the instance images, especially when these images are um, moving, like the, the image of the little uh, boy whose uh, who body washed you know, off of the, the beach, the British boy. And, uh, but there's, there's a con context to, to this. Um, another thing is that um, we tend to, in the West, in the United States, we tend to be moved by things when they start affecting us. But this crisis, the refugee crisis, has been going on for a few years, and the ones who are mostly affected are actually right next door to Syria. Um, so we have to 
be aware of that. So the, the conflict in Syria has entered its fifth year. It's a new anniversary in what has become the worst humanitarian crisis of our time. Uh, that's a big statement, right? It's the worst. And it began uh, a few years ago, in 2011, March 15th. We have a date, specific date. Now, uh, some of you remember what happened in 2011, not just in Syria, but things that have happened which led to Syria going through these problems. So, in 2011, um, uh, precisely in January uh, 2011, January 14, uh, there was a, a revolution in Tunisia where I was born. I grew up there. Uh, and uh, the revolution uh, in Tunisia uh, started as, uh, as a, a protest by an individual, Mohamed Bazizi, who was a, uh, a vegetable vendor on one of the streets of uh, remote interior towns in, in Tunisia. Uh, and uh, he was frustrated because, you know, the, the police in Tunisia were um, uh, corrupt. Uh, Tunisia under before the revolution was led by by a, a, a general called Ben Ali, who uh, basically built a very sophisticated police state. And the police uh, were harassing people, and in this case, they harassed uh, uh, the poor, uh, vegetable vendor in his 20s. And he was frustrated, so he uh, he took his case to the um, municipality and they to the mob. He went to uh, the governor's mansion. And the same thing happened, so he uh, immolated himself. He basically, poured gasoline on himself and lit himself up. And he was not the first one to do that in Tunisia, by the way. Several other Tunisians did the same exact thing. Nothing happened, but he struck a chord. He, uh, the, and the other thing is that because of these incredible transformations that we have uh, experienced in our lifetime, um, what he did, his act, uh, was filmed on smartphones and distributed all over the world. So uh, the pictures and the commentaries moved a lot of Tunisians in Tunisia, uh, but also moved a lot of people around the world. And that act, of defiance, because he did not pick up a gun and shoot somebody, he actually took it up uh, on himself. That inspired especially people all over the Arab world, because we know that all of the Arab countries were living in the dictatorship, all of them. It's the only place where you can generalize and you're right. You say all the Arab countries are dictatorships, it is correct. <laughs> Even though, uh, you know, all generalization generalizations are false and proven this way. So, uh, after Tunisia successfully, within, within uh, two weeks, overthrew a dictator who was extremely sophisticated, that actually inspired other young Arabs in uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, they didn't go to Libya first, they went to Egypt. Because Libya is between Tunisia and uh, Egypt. Why Egypt? Well, because Egypt has some similarities with Tunisia in terms of uh, uh, culture, uh, education, and things of that sort. Uh, and then it came back to Libya, and then it went back to Yemen, and then crossed to Syria. So between January and March, uh, many Arab countries, many Arab kids through age, basically, uh, began to participate in this incredible movement. And everyone was actually very hopeful. That's why they called it the Arab Spring. Uh, it was the uh, Eastern European Spring. And they thought this was really an Arab Spring because everybody had written off the Arab world from any kind of democratic change. And uh, some of you who have taken my classes uh, know that in the West, a lot of analysts and scientists, they said, well, the Arabs cannot really become democratic. Why? Well, most of them are Muslim, and Islam is incompatible with democracy. But that's a fallacy. Yeah? 
We can say that of any religion that's been compatible with the market. We can say that with, uh, about uh, Christianity. If we read, read the text, we can say the exact same things we say about Islam. Uh, Islam is, is uh, supposed to be anti-democratic, sexist, etc. But you read the Bible, you find these things that can make the same claims about uh, all the Torah, etc. Uh, but the reason they said uh, you know, Islam uh, is incompatible with democracy is because they looked at all the Muslim countries and they did, did not see any democratic state. So instead of say, saying that okay, all these democratic states, uh, the Muslim states are not democratic, they said, well, they try to explain it. They said they are not democratic because of their religion, their culture. And so the Tunisians proved them wrong. How come? Because 98% of Tunisians are Muslim. How come? And this is not you know, something that we exported to them. We didn't have Operation Endure Freedom for the Tunisia to give them democracy. No, they just did it by themselves. And the West was saying, oh, they are doing something by themselves. Uh, so that undermined all, this theory, all these theories about the culture. Right? Uh, but we have to say that Tunisians, Tunisian young, young Tunisians were able to do that because um, some would say they are the most westernized. Uh, I would argue that actually it's because they are more, the most modernized, not westernized. Uh, modernized means that they have achieved high level of education. Tunisians, Tunisian women are the highest educated in the uh, Arab world. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there are more Tunisian uh, women in the universities than men, especially in the health sciences. And Tunisia now has more uh, women in parliament than the United States in percentage. Uh, and some of them actually are uh, women who were discovered in parliament. So that Islamist women who are in parliament are educated. Uh, so that's why the Tunisians were able to do what they did is because of education, it's because you know, they're open uh, on the world, they use modern technology, hundreds of thousands of young Tunisians knew how to use Facebook, they had access to WikiLeaks, right? Uh, WikiLeaks uh, leaked some, um, some uh, messages from the American ambassador in Tunis who basically said, you know, uh, Ben Ali, the dictator, is bad. Uh, that all kinds of things which led the Tunisians to think that the United States is going to drop them because who supported the United States to stay in power? Like most dictators in the Middle East are supported by the United States. We supported uh, Mubarak, we supported Ben Ali, we supported all kinds of dictators. For, you know, uh, uh, national interest reasons. And it's very interesting that uh, when, when, the, when the, the, the dictator in Tunisia uh, fled the country, an incredible national movement, an armed movement, by the way, there was not even a knife. Uh, 300 young Tunisians your age uh, lost their lives. They were shot by the police. Uh, and what saved them is actually the army, the Tunisian army, the Republican army. They said, uh, we're not going to shoot uh, young kids, so he fled. And that inspired all kinds of, you know, uh, gave ideas to other countries. <coughs> And then it went to Syria, which is the focus of this uh, talk. Um, I was watching what was happening, and uh, I knew a lot about these countries. Uh, I was in Syria in uh, 2003, you know, a Fulbright scholarship in uh, Tunis, in the teaching at the University of Tunis. And I traveled in the Middle East, as part of my, uh, my Fulbright assignment. And I went to Damascus in 2004. 2004 in Damascus, and uh, uh, it looked pretty depressing. Uh, I was in, in a, a nice hotel in an area where there's a Shia shrine, and a lot of visitors come from Pakistan and from uh, Iran, etc. And this hotel was, uh, uh, you know, had transportation to take you to downtown. So I, 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 I took the transportation, and uh, there was only me on the phone. In the bus, a very many people in the same hotel in Syria. Uh, and the, the driver was uh, pretty depressed. So he looked at me and he said, Do you speak Arabic? I said, Yeah. And uh, then he asked me a few other questions. He was actually gauging me. 
He was trying to find out whether I can tell on him or not. Tell on him to whom? Yeah, to the Secret Service. Uh, yeah, I said the regime had an incredible network of uh, secret uh, police. In fact, the joke is that for every Syrian, there were like three secret police <laughs> following around. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, he asked me where I, was came, uh, where I came from. I said from uh, uh, Tunis, and then you know, uh, I explained to him I was teaching there from the United States. Once I said that from the United States, he kind of relaxed. Okay, this, is not, this guy is not a real Arab. <laughs> he has an open mind, he's been to the, he lives in the United States. So he opened up to me and he started talking. And, and what I was hearing is that um, things were about to explode. It was like, you know, Father uh, Kang. And they could not express themselves. They didn't trust each other. They did not talk to anybody, right? And the, the only thing that's you know, they have in common is that everything has a picture of the Assad family. The father has a huge portrait on top of a mountain, and then the son who died was supposed to become president after his father, and he died in a car crash with Playboy, I believe. And then they had to call, you know, the other son, who is a doctor, who's in power right now. Uh, because when they, when they had Bashar al-Assad in power, uh, President, everybody thought that he's a doctor, he's not you know, trained in the, in the system, so maybe he's going to be good. But he turned out to be from the same gene pool, right? Yeah. So uh, what happened is that we have a peaceful demonstration. And that's how it all started. Tunisia peaceful demonstration in Egypt, in Libya. Uh, the thing is that in Syria you cannot have a demonstration. Peaceful or not peaceful. So the response of the regime was uh, horrendous. Okay. Um, so, so far, we have hundreds of thousands of people killed. Um, and I uh, thought that you know, the, the regime uh, was capable of doing it. And the, the, the case uh, you know, rose up because the, the, the response of the, the regime was to Demonstration and kids actually spread painting messages. And we, we sent in the, you know, the police and check, they shot uh, the, the few first, and then the tanks showed up, and it comes hundreds, and then it comes thousands, because we started using airplanes, and then it's hundreds of thousands. And so we're talking about the poor of a million Syrians who have died from this, um, you know, in just a few years. So death and destruction um, now led, led to uh, people fleeing. So there were some people who were staying, but how many people have fled already? Millions. Millions of Syrians have fled the country. The country has about 25 million, there are only 18 million left. And the 18 million feel trapped. They don't feel that they can they, they, they can leave. So a serious economy has collapsed. 80% of the country is now lives in poverty. Half of all school-aged children have not attended school in three years. And there is you know, little of uh, light left. So literally, the country has gone down. 83% of the people society is now cut. And when you, if you go to Syria, there's a very good uh, report on the uh, front line uh, to, on Tuesday on PBS. We had uh, an American uh, reporter who went to Syria. And he just drove around and tried to uh, you know, have interviews with, uh, with uh, Assad, with Assad, Assad and some other people. And uh, it, is, it looks it's pretty overwhelming. It's, it's kind of scary. The whole country is demolished. And people, you, and you see people in the restaurants, and you see people, you know, uh, at the school, and you wonder how, how they are managing. How can, we, how can people continue to live in those uh, conditions? And you, you don't understand, you know, because you're 
comes all over the place, how can people have a normal life? But they don't. They don't have a normal life. And they ask some of the kids in school, and all they can say is that I have no future here. Even though they, you know, they're going to school in some places in, uh, in Damascus. They say, we have no future. And there's no place uh, where you can be, you can be uh, safe. So the United States has tried to, uh, you know, uh, uh, tackle the issue. Uh, but so far, we have international actors that who disagree on how to tackle the issue. So the United States, its position is that um, okay, we have supported Tunisia. It has been successful. We have uh, supported the Libyan uh, rebellion and uh, got rid of Gaddafi. Has not been successful. Uh, Libya has a civil war uh, going on. Uh, it's just in the numbers. Uh, the, de the number of dead in Syria is in the hundreds of thousands in Libya for the dead of thousands. Uh, we, uh, we uh, supported Mubarak and then we said, okay, let's drop him. Uh, but the, one, the ones who replaced him were not very valuable, the uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, and then ultimately they were overthrown by Sisi, who turned uh, the block back. So Egypt basically uh, is in a standstill position. Hasn't changed. Uh, Sisi, Obark are the same. So in uh, Egypt, even though Sisi uh, has all the whistles and bells of the uh, democratic system, the, the last elections, uh, about uh, depending on which numbers you look at, uh, the turnout is about two percent. <laughs> Think about you know we can blame the United States that our turnout is low. It's fifty percent, two percent. And the regime said, no, no, it's 6%. Big deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so who is uh, trying to stop, uh, let's say, the West and uh, some of the other countries to find a solution through the United Nations Council? Well, we have Russia and China. And that could be the Iran uh, Revolution. Why are the Russians opposing you know, getting rid of a dictator. Why are the Chinese opposing getting rid of a dictator? So we have to think about these things. We have to think about this new uh, con uh, you know, configuration that we have. Now, the Soviet Union has collapsed, but long live Russia. And so uh, Russia has changed its position with the uh, Western ambition in the Middle East. And this is, Russia sees this as an opportunity to come back to the Middle East. What do you see? Uh, Putin now uh, using force in Syria. And um, uh, interestingly, our failure to solve, help solve the problem in Syria has now led to uh, many Arab, uh, Arabs, I'm not talking about Arab leaders, right? I'm talking about the public, seeing Russia in a very positive light. <coughs> Russian intervention. They're saying that the Americans have been, you know, just pushing for their own self-interest, but they haven't done anything uh, uh, positive. They're, you know, and some actually go into the conspiracy theory, uh, arguing that uh, uh, perhaps the United States was responsible for the emergence of ISIS. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not far-fetched, but you know. It's not a total conspiracy theory because if we look at the history of the conflict and the emergence of ISIS, ISIS is fairly new, by the way. New kid on the block. And uh, how did ISIS emerge? Well, uh, it has a direct connection to our intervention in, in Iraq. What did we do in Iraq? Especially in the invasion of 2003. We came up with a great idea of George W. Bush decided that, that they were going to rebuild uh, Iraq in our image. How do you do that? Well, you get rid of every structure that they have over the past 60 years. What do they have? Well, they have a very strong socialist party called the Ba'ath Party. In the middle. The Ba'ath Party of Iraq. Now, can you do that? Can you take the biggest structure of a country and eliminate it? And think that the country is going to remain stable? Impossible. 
Did we denazify Germany after World War II completely? I don't think so. I mean, Germany was rebuilt by basically former Nazis. It's just they said, okay, I, I hate the Nazis, and I, that was a mistake. We actually, you know, said, okay, don't say that you're a Nazi, and you're okay. But if it, most of the leaders of Germany, who made Germany what it is, if you look at in their past, you find them in Euro uniform with the, you know, the Nazi youth, including Helmut Schmidt. There are pictures of Helmut Schmidt in a Nazi youth uniform. In Iraq, we said, okay, no bad. What, uh, what else? Well, um, eliminate the army. Because the army is connected to the back. So when you eliminate, when we're talking about the leadership, that built the infrastructure that are using the party and the army. When you eliminate these two, and it's not a homogeneous country. Tunisia is lucky because 98% are actually uh, Muslim the same. Sunnis. Iraq, the majority, is not in power, and it's Shia. Saddam and his friends, even though he's been more inclusive than the current government that he put in place, uh, was Sunni. So when we get a country like that, and we don't really rebuild anything, because you know, who's rebuilding uh, Iraq, you know, the um, responsibility to rebuild Iraq, corrupt American corporations like Paul Who I see uh, Iraq has an opportunity to grab the cash and run. We actually did not really do much in Iraq. We you know, de-developed it. The, the, the federal government gave a lot of money to uh, private contractors. And that money disappeared. We have pictures of American soldiers with mountains of cash in Iraq behind them. Mountains of gold. Where did that go? It disappeared. Um, so we have this reconfiguration now um, you know, taking place in Syria. And we are partly responsible for it. So ISIS. <coughs> actually uh, was given birth in Iraq because we created a vacuum. The, the, the government we put in place, Shia government, uh, was completely uh, incompetent. Uh, what did they do? Well, they, they were pretty vindictive. So when the Sunni minority was completely marginalized, tried to demonstrate peacefully to ask for representation, uh, al-Maliki, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister al-Maliki, what did he do? He unleashed his militias and uh, thugs and killed them. Who came to the rescue? A bunch of terrorists from Syria. ISIS. They walked in, they found a minority in this thread. they said, okay, we're gonna help you. The first thing they did, opened all the prisons. That uh, all the prisoners are, so including the head of ISIS. And by that he was in jail. They let them loose. Uh, and then they started, you know, killing everybody. I'm talking about Shia, especially. Right? And the Sunni said, okay, we can look the other way because they're helping us out against this money. Um, so ISIS was actually created by both our intervention in Iraq and also the government we put in Iraq. And ISIS was, was fighting against the Bashar al-Assad had no intention of building state did not know how to build the state. But when they walked in Iraq, help of this, the, the, the marginalized Sunnis, guess who were these Sunnis? They were Baathists, former army officers who had no income. But they, they had knowledge on how to build the state. They are the ones who actually are helping ISIS not only take territory, but hold on to it. They are those who are planning how to attack and capture an oil, an oil, an oil, an oil field and a uh, power plant and run it. ISIS now looks, on the, if, you, if you look at their, at their papers, they look like a state. Look at their, their, their papers, you find that they actually have, have the Department of Taxation and they collect taxes, all kinds of taxations. They have Muslim taxation and they have also bureaucratic taxation. Uh, they have schools, they run the electricity, they do all kinds of things. They did not know how to do that. They, used, they knew how to use guns. They were trained in Libya, because Libya is chaotic, and then 
within a couple of weeks they go and that they fight because they they were brainwashed because when they die fighting injustice they're going to go to uh, heaven. Right? Uh, but now that, that even that idea has changed because now they have become bureaucrats and heaven doesn't matter anymore because there's money. <laughs> uh, they've got you know a few billion dollars and they want to live to to uh, use that money. So now the some of the pictures of the fighting, some of the ISIS uh, fighters are not as convinced as they used to be. They, they start to run away. <laughs> they used to just walk into the, you know, the fire. The fire. <coughs> but now they have become more like a state, right? So the, uh, the, 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 the quagmire in Syria, now uh, uh, not only did we uh, fail to try to solve or to bring the various uh, uh, parties to the table. Uh, we are also, sometimes we don't know which one we are hunting. Sometimes we drop weapons for a group and another group gets it. Uh, we can't form an international coalition. So Russia and China on one side, the United States uh, on the other side. Even the Arab countries. We have uh, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates who want to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. But we have Qatar, who is helping Islamists. And in some cases, the terrorists, the people terrorists. When I was in the, on my fourth flight in Qatar in 2013-2014, Qatar is basically desert, it's extremely hot, but they have these beautiful malls with our, you know, several uh, football teams. Um, and when you enter the these uh, air conditioned you know, Western malls, at, the, at, each, at each entrance, they have like 12 or 20 entrances, there is a um, huge box the size of the table's glass, right? it's and there is a cleric, they don't have clerics, but there's a guy with a huge beard, who so is basically a Wahhabi, um, devout Wahhabi, not I don't want to say fanatic, but close to that. Who's sitting there, and he has a picture of Syrian refugees. Even though Qatar doesn't take a photo. And kids being blown, blown up. And he's collecting money for the Syrian women, for the Syrian refugees. And there's mountains of cash in that one. And uh, the government is looking the other way. Right? You know where that money is going? Going to, it's not going to the same way. It's going to, you know, the ones who want an Islamic state. It's going to the terrorists. The people just don't put money in there. But these guys are very clever. They have a picture of a, you know, a baby and they have a picture of a woman. But the money is not going there. The, the, the people are collecting it. Look scarier than <laughs> And you can tell because when a woman walks up to talk to them, they look the other way. Yes. You can tell they're fanatics. Because Qataris are pretty pretty uh, easy going. But the average Qataris, they're pretty westernized, they have two uh, smartphones, they, you know, they sit all day and sit all day. But these guys at the entrance, you know, you better be covered when you're a woman to walk more comfortably. Put the money in just so the refugees where do they go? where have they gone? yeah we talk about the refugees because all the, all the news, but we're talking about Europe. So uh, we are praising uh, Germany for its largesse. Uh, uh, Angela Merkel is, call, is called by the refugees uh, Mother Merkel. Uh, and they, they ask, her to, the, the Syrian Christians ask her both to make her saint. saint. Mm -hmm. But how many is, is she taking? She's taking a, you know, a few tens of thousands, like maybe a hundred thousand. The French, they said that they would take 20,000. 
the United States said, okay, I'll take uh, all 10,000 Syrians. <laughs> and uh, uh, Donald Trump said, I'll send, I'll send them right back. <laughs> <laughs> so where did they go? Because we are talking about, you know, um, millions. Right? Yeah, right next door. Right next door. Uh, let's look at the, some of the numbers. So, remember Syrian force to seek shelter abroad since the civil war began in March 2011. Uh, it has surpassed 2 million people in September 2011. That's an incredible number. Right? Two, uh, uh, 2 million uh, people. So, where did they go? Well, Lebanon, the largest number of registered Syrian refugees were over 622,000 people of that in uh, Syria. And they have refugees who are waiting to be registered. Now think about this. The Syrian refugee population in Lebanon represents more than 18% of Lebanon's population. We are, we are 330 million, we are taking 10,000. And we are complaining, and our President Kansak is saying we're going to send them back. Now, Lebanon's population increased by 18% in the refugees. Well, imagine that happening to us in Mexico, right? <laughs> we have just a few million uh, illegal immigrants, and we're in the whole debate so this, this is about you know, how to build the wall and keep them out. Uh, where does Lebanon get the money to, to take care of these people? Because they have to school them, they have to feed them, they have to do all these things. Refugees cannot work, by the way. Not because they are not able to, you know, they are not, they can do the work. They are not allowed. They are not allowed to work. When you are a refugee, you are not allowed to work. So the status doesn't allow you. Who can work in, in a country where if you have to have a legal status? Uh, where else? This is like some of the people that want to They can't work, they can't. They can't go to school. So it's like pretty much like worse than they were, kind of. Right. I, I mentioned the Tunisian revolution. Do you know what the Tunisian revolution slogans were? Who knows? There are two, two slogans. Or, or three. The first one is actually dignity. Haram. Liberty. Freedom. Okay? And of course, jobs. So, most of those, you know, refugees, they are actually, uh, when they cannot work, they are losing their dignity. And many of them actually are middle class and, and hardly educated. Mm -hmm. Remember that, that, uh, that man with the little uh, uh, boy who was stripped by the Hungarian camera woman on, on YouTube? Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, she was fired, and now she's trying, she's not to sue the man she tripped. <laughs> but this one. Uh, that man was actually a soccer coach. And he was hired by Real Madrid. Real Madrid invited him and his kid. And his kid hung out with, with uh, Ronaldo. These are educated people. And if you are sit idly in, in a... And you also, you are in a refugee camp. So you're dehumanized. Uh, uh, and also every now and then you hear some of those, um, you know, right-wingers coming to spit at you and uh, shout at you. So there's Jordan, very quickly, there's Turkey, and these are numbers, incredible numbers. And they're spending billions of dollars on the refugees, and the United Nations giving them a few, a few million. So, so who, who's going to pay for it? Where is the international community? So there is a big problem with regard to this incredible crisis. So I had read that Obama had up to 100,000. True. And 
but when are they going to come to Seattle? We're ready. We want to take them. We do, right? When they come here, we're going to help them, right? So well, it's, 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 it's fascinating how the, the, the people's willingness to, to help uh, is not matched by the, by the government's openness. So even in Europe, in Europe the same thing. The Germans are the people are saying, we let them come. And the Hungarians are stopping them, don't go. And, so, but why? and now they, uh, the Hungarians, for example, are passing lots of people to the jail. Any uh, questions? Yeah. Well, I I watched documentary in Japan about this this problem, and um, a lot of refugees are uh, like um, kind of arrested. But um, how how can they enter the um the another country? I mean. They can they can walk and they can run into the border, but um, they don't have any passport and they they will be arrested if it's like obvious. So how how can they? You know? Well, uh, uh, most of the refugees they have documentation, they have papers. So we're not talking about uh, them not having passports mm -hmm. or doing illegal things. Uh, what the Hungarians and the Czech etc. are doing is that they're stopping them for other reasons. So can everyone like move? Well, that's that's what you know. The Germany is asking of the international community is asking of those countries who are stopping them to let them pass because they're not staying in there. Uh, so it's it's a it's a problem from those those countries. Yeah. Well, so. These uh, these countries are losing a lot of money because um, because they're trying to support all these refugees. Could a possible solution be just to uh, let the refugees work while they're there, and then they could generate some revenue from taxing their income? That's a very difficult mm -hmm. proposition. Most countries they don't allow uh, refugees to work. It's, it's a legal thing. Uh, so there are. The, few individuals who will find ways to work, uh, or if they stay for a long time, then uh, find a way to change their status. But even in Europe, they can they can work because they are not uh, uh, the assumption that they are going to be repatriated. Uh, the problem with Syria is that no one is saying that the conflict is going to be you know going to be ended tomorrow. Most analysts think that what is happening in Syria uh, is going to go on indefinitely. And we have an example in Lebanon. The civil war in Lebanon lasted for uh, from 75 to 1980. You know, 1980s. So we're talking about a long, long time. And Syria and Lebanon are very, very much the same. Uh, similar composition from the sectarianism. Uh, they're, they're the same country. So Syria is going to go on for a while. Uh, the other thing is that the dictatorship in Syria is from a minority. It's only 30% of the, of the population. And uh, the thinking is that if we give up power, we're going to be uh, killed. I don't think that's, that's, that, that's uh, you know, a correct assessment, but it's fear. Plus, they've been in power for such a long time, privileged. So a minority that's privileged for a long time is not going to give up power easily. So, but they are actually working against their own interests. It's better for the Alawites to sit down and uh, try to find a solution and even drop, you know, the support for Bashar al-Assad because in the long run, it's in, in their interest. If they don't do it now, there's no way for 20% to dominate the country forever. No way. They're going to lose. But the more they hang on, the more they support the repressive regime, the more they're going to be punished. If they're smart, they'll sit down and figure out a way and then take what they can get. The Lebanese, you know, about 250,000 Lebanese died in the Civil War. But finally they sat down. So we have, uh, you know, in Lebanon, it's all, all minorities. And two big 
big, big, big uh, sects of the Shia and the Sunnis, but then you have, you know, uh, subsects of the Shia, you have the uh, Jews, uh, you have Christians, uh, and even the Christians there are different denominations. But they finally got out of the war, and they sat down and they are trying to put uh, a way out of the uh, violence. Syria, I don't know, even the ones who, are, who, want, who want democracy and who want a uh, peaceful solution, I was watching a program, a uh, mi tiny minority. But even those, they can't even agree among themselves. This is a big dilemma. Uh, the Syrians need to be, at, if they cannot find a way themselves, they need to be coached. And coached by someone who you know, knows how to solve uh, problems without you know, bringing a baggage of you know, pushing for someone else's interest. But it can't be an American or a Russian or a Chinese. It has to be someone from the United Nations. We already have the uh, uh, Nahd Ibrahim, very uh, seasoned diplomat uh, from Algeria, uh, with the United Nations, and he gave up. He resigned. He tried and tried and he resigned. Is there any successful Yeah, there are there are some ways to, to help them. Uh, uh, it has to be done from the United Nations. The United Nations needs to sort out, uh, for, for example, this this uh, competition between the, the various powers. So foreign intervention needs to be taken out. So now we have the Americans are bombing, the, the uh, Russians are bombing, the Chinese are bombing. Turkey is bombing, uh, Saudi Arabia is bombing. So all these have to be taken out. Also, the fighters, the foreign fighters inside have to be uh, <coughs> thrown out. And then the Syrians have to sit down. So the, the foreign elements in, 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 a, in a conflict like this need to, needs to be taken out. Uh, Tunisia was successful because there is no foreign element. So to kind of take back off what he was saying, I understand that it is currently illegal for the refugees to work, but what's stopping them so we buy even that law so they can make it? Why would we not want to make that law different so we can make it actually off of the people who are in the country? Is there a legitimate reason for it? Is there one of those things like that's how it's always been, so it's how it's been? I think it's a political decision. Um, uh, because they become immigrants, <laughs> there's an anti immigration sentiment. So uh, for politicians to change the laws, they're going to lose votes for those who are against immigration. When they say it's refugees, they don't work, then they're, you know, they're calling down the anti-immigration sentiments. But if they decide to employ them and make them immigrants, immigrants then they're, they're going to have to face the right, you know, the right way. But ultimately, I think, especially in Germany, in Germany, ultimately they don't want to uh, integrate them in the workforce. The Germany needs workers. And the Syrians are going there with their highest skill. So Merkel is making a political decision. So Germany needs them. We all change legislation in Germany. So we can grant them faster asylum. Uh, I think Germany hired or even doubled the persons who give the asylum to make it more faster. But there are just too much too many, so they have like really long waiting lists for Syrian refugees and now Germany tries to get capable of them hiring persons to, to give them the assignment. And historically uh, Syrian immigrants are among the most successful immigrants in the world, by the way. Including the Syrians in the United States. The Syrians in the United States, they came actually, you know, with the Columbus. They, they go uh, and, and many of you don't even know when you see a Syrian American. Uh, many of the, you know, your uh, uh, American children were educated by Syrian uh, teachers. Some teachers in Ohio and other places like that. Really. 
but they cannot, they cannot tell because they are Christian, they are Christian Jews. So, so the Syrian diaspora is one of the most um, successful. When I was uh, in college at uh, Fort Worth State University, the governor of Oregon was Syrian. John Atia was a Syrian, in Syrian, Syrian descent. In the US, we don't have any. We, we said we're going to take 10,000, and then uh, Obama said we can take. Uh, I'm not sure about the process, but I think there's a legal process that has to be, you know, put in place before we can get. It is. 